Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, grab a stool. Glad you're here. It's the Wednesday Three Martini Lunch. We've got plenty to talk about. Good, bad, and crazy martinis. We're brought to you today by Ernest. Right now, Three Martini Lunch listeners can get a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at earnest.com slash martini. We'll have much more on that in just a moment. And, Jim, before we get to our good martini, which is a very good martini today, I would say, a couple of quick housekeeping items uh, to talk about today. First of all, I I just find it curious that uh, when the Dow is tanking, uh, there's the live box on CNN and MSNBC all day long with look how much red ink there is. And there's a lot. But yesterday, when it was up 1,000 and up all day, it kind of surged towards the end. It wasn't up that much throughout the day. Curiously, the, the box wasn't there. Little little tiny thing down in the ticker like it usually is, but but not, uh, not uh, taking up a prominent place on the screen. So I'm sure it's just a coincidence, right? Yeah, I was going to say, Greg, the, the only good news when you see the stock market dropping by something really dramatic is that there's a very good chance the next day a decent number of investors will say, wait a minute, that what were we thinking? You know, we we are seriously undervaluing these stocks. They'll start you know buying, and it'll go back up. You no, know, maybe not the full drop that they had the previous day, but you know, again, you know, you lose two thousand in a day. Everybody's got that holy smokes, that's terrible thing. You get back nine hundred <laughs> within a you know within a day or two. That's not so bad. You know, it's not 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 as good as you'd like it to be. And I certainly can make you know make people jittery, but. Uh, you know, the good news is oftentimes, ev- you know, eventually, the market goes back up. Of course, whether it goes back up enough in time for you to retire, you know, that's a different story. And we talked a lot about coronavirus uh, yesterday. We'll probably talk about it again some today. Uh, Jim, uh, who do you think is uh, enjoying the coronavirus excuse most right now? We've got colleges saying that we're going on spring break and it's all online learning from there. So students are getting an extended spring break and then eventually they pick up with their studies online with professors and who knows how much interest they're going to have on spending the same amount of energy on their classes as they did before. Or... Hunter Biden, who says he can't attend the child support hearing for his out-of-wedlock child in Arkansas because his new wife, who is pregnant, uh, could be at risk of coronavirus if he travels to uh, the hearing. So uh, what do you make of these excuses? Yeah, that's particularly convenient. I think I want to nominate a third one where somebody said that in the interest of public safety and an abundance of caution, I will be self-quarantining next Thursday and Friday. <laughs> and everyone's like, wait a second, is that when the NCAA tournament begins? He's like, look, it just happens to be, I feel like that's the right choice for the safety of everyone. Maybe it's the excuse everyone's been looking for. Uh, there's already uh, a lot of hand ringing about whether there should be audiences at the uh, college basketball tournament this year. And now there's a uh, columnist on USA Today saying that uh, they should just cancel the whole tournament. And I'm saying that's where I draw the line. I really want an audience there, but I absolutely must have March Madness. So that's that's my line in the sand. But let's get on to our actual martinis now, Jim, because we've got really good news in our first martini here. We have justice. Uh, let's go to NPR, because with the conviction of Harvey Weinstein, I quoted NBC, and that's just wrong. After everything <laughs> they did to bury the story, we're not doing that. Again, this is NPR. Harvey Weinstein has been sentenced to 23 years in prison. Judge James Burke handed down the decision in a Manhattan courtroom Wednesday as the disgraced movie mogul watched, flanked by his legal team, his 20-year sentence for a criminal sexual act, the more serious of the two counts he was convicted of last month, is on the higher end of New York State's guidelines. For the other count, rape in the third degree, Weinstein was sentenced to three years in prison. So, uh, Jim, uh, justice was delayed here. Uh, so, as the saying goes, it was denied on some level. But uh, Harvey Weinstein is going to prison for a very long time. His lawyers said five years would essentially be a life sentence. But uh, 23 years is what it is. A lot of people in this country have said the rich and the powerful, they always get away with it. They either skate entirely or they get a slap on the wrist and uh, regular people can't get the same kind of treatment. Well, this seems like pretty much the same kind of treatment finally for Harvey Weinstein. And to watch the cataclysmic fall here, I mean, this guy wasn't as well known, but I mean, this is one of the most powerful figures in Hollywood. This is akin to a criminal conviction for like Spielberg or Cruz or something like that. And to watch the justice system work, no matter who the defendant is, uh, is amazing. Greg, when I saw the news yesterday that his lawyers were making the argument, giving him a five-year sentence is 
he, he's going to die in prison. That's like a life sentence. I remember thinking, okay, your terms are acceptable. <laughs> The the better way of looking at it, you know, look, this is a you know, this is a twenty one year sentence is an excellent chance. This is indeed a life sentence looking at the actuarial tables. And oh, by the way, there's still the Los Angeles case where he could theoretically get another nineteen years on top of that. If you believe that Jeffrey Epstein was committed suicide, when you see that, I suppose he's got his he's met his maker and, and faced his judgment. But for some of us, it denies us that moment of seeing the person in the courtroom of holding the person accountable, of having a full accounting of all of their crimes and letting the world know exactly what they did, how terrible it was, and how much we should hold these people in utter disdain. We got that with Weinstein. Uh, I I imagine his victims, this probably doesn't make all the pain go away, but this does give them a sense that it was not in vain and that telling their stories was not in vain. Hopefully this sends a signal to every, you know, potential, every potential predator out there in not just in Hollywood, but in media and business and and education and and all kinds of and religious institutions you know the law will catch you the law will hold you accountable the evidence will be held the victims will be heard and you cannot escape justice and i think there are a lot of people for a long time who looked at it and thought you know harvey might be able to walk on this he might be able to demonize the accusers he he'd reached one deal with a whole bunch of them that he was going to be able to buy his way out of this he did not and it demonstrates that you know after a long and difficult road, at least in this particular set of circumstances, the American justice system appears to be working the way it's supposed to. How do you think Ronan Farrow feels today? You know, probably pretty darn good. Uh, but I think that the recognition, like, it's hard to be, as we said this with the conviction, it's hard to feel really fantastic about this because we keep in mind, one, how overdue this was, how many people either knew and heard rumors, the, the Seth MacFarlane joke at the Oscars years ago, He acted with impunity for a really, really long time, and I feel like we still haven't quite grappled the ramifications of that. All right. Well, let's talk about something happier, and that's the uh, opportunity to save yourself some money as we talk about earnest. Uh, We talked about how the markets were tanking, and one of the reasons for that is uh, low yields on on the bond market, which means interest rates are at a pretty good spot right now. A lot of people refinancing their homes if they've got a good opportunity to do that. Rates are at a point where they're not likely to stay for a very long time. So do you have student loans? Because refinancing them with earnest could save you money or lower your monthly payment, and it really only takes two minutes to check your rate online. We know that life can be unpredictable. We've been talking about it a lot the last few days and the disruptions that a lot of folks might face. But you don't want that to affect your bank account as much as humanly possible. So whether you want to lower your monthly expenses or pay off debt sooner, Earnest Student Loan Refinancing has a solution for you. If you're still paying the same rate you were when you graduated, Odds are you could reduce your monthly payment and save big, even if you have refinanced before. With today's low-rate environment, most people can save by refinancing again. Earnest is the easiest way to refinance your student loans, and it saves you time and money. Checking your new rate is fast and easy. To start, you just complete a few questions online. It only takes about two minutes, and you will get a personalized rate estimate, all without affecting your credit score. If you qualify, Earnest offers customizable loan terms and no fees. You can even combine private and federal loans, so imagine having just one single monthly payment with one low rate. If you've already refinanced a loan, no problem. You can still be eligible to lower your interest rate again. Plus, the internet loves Earnest's customer service. They are rated 9.4 out of 10 on Trustpilot, so you know you'll always get the support you need. So start saving today. Three Martini Lunch listeners get a $100 cash bonus when they refinance a student loan at earnest.com slash martini. That's a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan at earnest, E-A-R-N-E-S-T, dot com slash martini. Go to earnest.com slash martini today. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, Jim, let's head to our bad martini now. And yesterday was Super Tuesday 2.0, Mini Tuesday, had a few different nicknames. But as we talked about yesterday, not a lot of drama. We expected a big night for Joe Biden. That's exactly what we got. He won so big in Mississippi, in fact, Bernie didn't even get to 15% in a two-man race. Uh, So that's not a good sign for the Sanders campaign. Big win for Biden in Missouri. Uh, An easy win in Michigan. The polls were showing that. Uh, Didn't quite get to the 20% uh, 
line that some of those surveys were showing, but uh, Biden's over 50 percent. Sanders didn't get to 40. Uh, He also won in Idaho. Bernie did win the North Dakota caucuses. Uh, and we still don't know what happened in Washington because of the mail-in ballot situation there. But uh, uh, it's not certainly looking like a dominant Sanders win. At the moment, he's up uh, just a fraction uh, over Joe Biden. So uh, now the the question becomes, what becomes of this campaign? And uh, Jim Clyburn, who completely turned this race around with his Biden endorsement in South Carolina, has decided now that his guy's up, well... He's decided that it's time to pretty much shut this thing down. Uh, Last night, he says, quote, I think when the night is over, this is to NPR, Joe Biden will be the prohibitive favorite to win the Democratic nomination. And quite frankly, if the night ends the way it has begun, I think it is time for us to shut this primary down. It is time for us to cancel the rest of these debates because you don't do anything but get yourself in trouble if you continue in this contest when it's obvious that the numbers will not shake out for you. Pressed on the issue, Clyburn said a clean sweep would make Biden the prohibitive nominee, and he added that the DNC should step in, make an assessment, and determine whether they ought to have any more debates. And so, Jim, when you look at the way the the Democrats uh, apportion delegates, uh, it's very, very difficult for Sanders to find a way back, and there's no sign that he's got any sort of momentum here. At the same time, there's a debate scheduled for Sunday. As of yesterday, it was very much all systems go because there was an announcement that there's going to be no audience at the debate due to coronavirus concerns. And uh, this is basically Sanders' last chance to change the momentum in this case. And a lot of people would be watching closely because Biden, of course, has had a lot of uh, brain cramps or malapropisms or senior moments, whatever you want to call them, on a debate stage when there's been half a dozen or more candidates out there. Now that it's one-on-one, a lot of people wanting to see whether he can handle that for an hour or two hours or however long this thing's going to be. Uh, and so the idea that the Democrats now, particularly the establishment Democrats, are looking to wrap this up makes it look like they got something to hide, I think. Yeah, there, there's a, a lot to unpack here, Greg. The first is we should keep let our listeners know at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, Bernie Sanders is scheduled to have a press conference. I have not heard any indication that, conference, that uh, Bernie Sanders is dropping out. It's probably just going to be a, we had a rough night, but I'm going to fight on, you know, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, th- this, I think the argument that Sanders should, you know, concede defeat is pretty strong here. I, I think it's not just that he lost last night and he lost, you know, pretty badly. It's that he lost every county in Michigan. It's that he lost every county in Missouri. Mississippi was never looking great, but that was uh, another one. And as I wrote yesterday in the corner, you look at the upcoming states, none of them look good for Bernie Sanders. You you probably have to go about a month to out Wisconsin on April 7th before you get to a state that has a decent number of delegates that looks like it could be a Sanders win. Um, All of a sudden, the calendar looks really rough for him. Uh, And they're just, you know, Ohio's voting next week. He's not going to win that. You know, this thing is effectively over. So the question is up to him. Does he want to keep running? Of course, they're still going to keep having these primaries and, you know, you can still vote in them. But all in all, it's pretty clear. Joe Biden is probably going to go into the uh, convention either with sufficient number of delegates or just short of it. And when they go to a second ballot, the super delegates will make this. Look, it appears there is a consensus in the Democratic Party. So in that case, I actually think Clyburn has a, a strong point that, look, the race is effectively over there's a certain argument to said that, you know, Sanders should, you know, say, OK, I realize I'm beat. Let's unite. Let's focus on beating Trump, et cetera. It's very clear why Clyburn would want to get to that. I'm sure the Bernie Sanders supporters may not share that feeling. The thing is, is when he says, let's shut this down. Well, there's this pre-existing narrative that the Democratic establishment is out to cheat Bernie Sanders. It's out to screw him over to, to not, you know, let, let's let's end this race, et cetera. It was really bad wording on his part. And it's probably a bad sign that uh uh, my, my suspicion is is that uh, the Bernie Sanders fans will not want him to support to drop out. And like I said, so far, it doesn't look like Sanders is going to drop out. That having been said, you know, whether or not he drops out, the Bernie Sanders rate, campaign is effectively over. Jim, even if you thought the math wasn't in your favor, if you were running against a guy who was trending on Twitter as Biden's cognitive decline, wouldn't you want a couple more cracks at him on the debate stage just to... Uh, perhaps sow a little doubt in the minds of the electorate before they completely lock in on their nominee? Oh, you know, if I think one of the factors that kicked in after Nevada was, let's you know, a sense of buyer's remorse amongst Democrats of, oh my goodness, this guy could end up getting slaughtered against Trump. 
let's go with the safer option. If Biden continues to have bad days, you know, look, a two-hour debate, sure, you know, Biden could collapse. Now, they, they could have a, a really rough night. Now, my suspicion is that we've already seen the, you know, because of the coronavirus, the claim that they're not going to have uh, an audience uh, or a spin room or even a press center for the debate. Um, I think it's I think it's a very open question as to whether the debate goes forward on Sunday. I think if you're the Biden campaign, you're like, you know what? We've just swept everything. It looks like we're going to sweep everything. We don't feel like showing up for the debate. And, you know, I, I, I don't think it's the craziest thought. You know, it's certainly like we have a lack of debates. I completely understand why the Bernie Sanders folks would be, oh, now that it's down to two of us, we absolutely have to have a debate. But, uh, you know, if you're a Biden, you're in the driver's seat right now. And I'm not sure how much leverage Bernie Sanders still has. Hmm. Well, let's flip the script, though. Let's say that Biden did really well in the first three and then Sanders went on a tear, at which point, if that were the case, the establishment would be freaking out right now. I don't think they'd be saying that this debate should just go away. I think they'd be saying this is Joe Biden's last chance to do something about it. We've also got uh, reports that Biden is uh, shortening his stump speeches with teleprompters to less than 10 minutes in some situations. So it's almost like uh, what happens when there's a recount, Jim. We have recounts until the Democrats ahead and then we stop having recounts. That's kind of how this feels here from Jim Clyburn, even though the math is clearly in Biden's like, favor here. But if I were the Biden campaign, I think I might want to roll the dice here, do well in the debate, dominate Tuesday, and then you can mothball him till the convention and blame it on coronavirus. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I'm wondering about is that, you know, this the coronavirus coming along and you know, we saw both candidates say they don't want to have rallies in Cleveland. To, you know, they're, they're postponing these sorts of things. You know, Biden could now run a variation of the Mike Bloomberg campaign, switch everything to TV advertising, do it all through TV interviews. Out of an abundance of precaution, of caution, <laughs> we're going to, you know, not have Biden interacting with people, which means they won't have things like him interacting with that, you know, construction worker screaming, I'm going to slap you and I want to take your AR-14. By the way, Greg, I don't know about you, I'm willing to give up my AR-14. I think we all should, as we, yeah. As long as we get, as long as we get to keep the AR-15, <laughs> that strikes me as a fair compromise. All right, Jim, uh, as you know, um, at most we have two real candidates at this point. Tulsi's still in, not really sure why, but uh, nonetheless, uh, some folks are starting to look back at uh, the candidates who are no longer with us in this campaign. One of those is Elizabeth Warren. And so there's a lot of uh, hand-wringing. Didn't see this so much when Klobuchar dropped out, but uh, all the uh, sexism allegations came out of the woodwork when Elizabeth Warren dropped out after Super Tuesday. One that we're going to talk about today is a story in The Atlantic, a, a story by a woman named Ellen O'Connell Wittett. She is a progressive, and she had a very difficult moment in her marriage because she and her husband voted for different people. She voted for Warren. Her husband voted for Sanders. And she writes, My husband and I started dating just before the 2012 election. After the results of that election came in, he texted me that, yes, it was great that we got four more years of Barack Obama, but what he'd really be excited for was to vote for President Warren one day. I reminded him of this recently, and he maintains that he would have liked to see her in the White House. But when we had the chance to choose, I saw him vote for strategy over idealism, a decision I suspect many felt forced to make after Warren went from frontrunner to underdog. After a few tearful conversations in the week leading up to Super Tuesday, I could not make my husband understand what seemed so monumental to me about Warren's campaign. To him, what was important was avoiding a contested convention, and he told me he saw his vote for Sanders as one against Biden, the more moderate establishment candidate. Quote, and Bernie is one of the good guys, he said. Quote, but he doesn't get as much done as Liz. I replied weakly. So the title of this column, Jim, is I voted for Warren. My husband voted for Sanders and I feel betrayed. I remember stories about marriages breaking up when the husband was voting for Trump and the wife wouldn't do it back in 2016, Jim. Uh, I, I feel like stories are these are signs that if politics plays this critical of a role in your marriage, something's deeply wrong. Do you ever get the feeling it's not really what they're fighting about isn't really the candidates? <laughs> right. I mean, there's some deeper issue of I feel like you don't respect me or uh, I don't think you see the world the way I do. I can't handle the the fact that you disagree with me. You left the toilet seat up. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, whatever the issue, the, the, the core issue is there. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. I don't hear, I mean, maybe this was going on in Republican circles in 2016. Greg, did we see any, you know, I, I supported Ted Cruz. My wife is voting for Carly Fiorina. I want a divorce type discussion. Like, I just, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe they got back together when the two of them formed the unity ticket that lasted for about four days. 
do you need your spouse to vote for the same candidate you do every time like, in a primary? <laughs> like, I could almost see, but even then, Carvel and Madeline uh, uh, relationships you know tend to work. You know, they're you know the ones where people have different uh, political views. There are plenty of happy marriages like that, in part because these couples don't decide like who you vote for is not the defining characteristic of who you are as a person. If the whole point of being with someone who is just like you, Greg, we would all be in a gay marriage. Men and women are often going to be very, look at things very differently. So women shouldn't be surprised that they have this different one. I think this indicates, though, uh, and by the way, those, like, the other great irony is, of course, we on the right are looking at this and saying, Warren and Sanders, is it that much difference? Really? You know, but I absolutely, it's not just issues. It's, you know, voting for a woman and all that stuff. Now, I think what she means is when the, the husband said, oh, I'd vote for a woman if I could, but I couldn't vote, you know. But in the end, he's break promises. That's the root of that complaint. But uh, that's this is really one that's more for a marital therapist and not one for the op-ed pages. <laughs> I can imagine in 2016, if uh, in the uh, in the primary, if uh, one spouse voted for Trump and uh, one person was more establishment. Uh, I don't know if there were a lot of Trump Jeb splits in, in most houses and so forth. But you know, you and I voted for different people in the Virginia primary, and look at us here. Uh, four years later, we're doing just fine. So it can be done, people. I've totally forgiven you, Greg. (laughs) I didn't even remember who you voted for. So there you go. (laughs) Exactly. There you go. All right. So, Jim, we'll see what uh, mass closures we have tomorrow and other political uh, wranglings. But uh, I'm sure it won't be boring. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thank you for being with us today. Don't forget to visit our great sponsors over at Ernest.com, Ernest.com slash martini, and you'll get a $100 cash bonus when you refinance a student loan with Ernest. Also, please subscribe to the podcast, leave us a kind review, and remember that you can get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. And please be with us on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.